Knock, knock. I'm dermatologist, Dr. Abby Waldman, and today we're gonna talk about the connection between your gut health and your skin. So there's more and more data out there now that connects gut inflammation with skin inflammation and conditions like rosacea and acne and psoriasis atopic dermatitis, and hydradenitis suppurativa. So what can you do to improve your gut health to improve your skin? In this video, I'll answer your questions about the gut microbiome, discuss the best diet and supplements to support your gut. So what does it mean to have a healthy gut? A healthy gut means that you have either helpful or inert microbes in your intestines. So in your intestines right now, there are a quadrillion microbial cells, 1,000 trillion microbial cells. Those are bacteria, include archaea, eukaryote, and then also viruses. The majority of these are in the large intestine or the colon. Vast majority of these microbes are actually helping us. So first, the good bacteria and other microbes work by colonizing the area and keeping bad pathogens from getting in. Kind of like a yard where the grass will grow and it'll actually keep some of the weeds from taking root. The second thing that your gut microbes can do for you is actually make vitamins. They will convert complex polysaccharides into vitamins that you need to live, such as vitamin K and vitamin B12. And the third thing, which is probably the most relevant to the skin, is that when you eat fiber, that fiber can't be broken down or used by you. And so what happens is it makes its way to the colon and the bacteria there will actually ferment the fiber and make it into very useful things. And some of them are short chain fatty acids, which serve as signaling molecules. They're anti-inflammatory. They help maintain the skin barrier. And some of these can actually be antimicrobial. They can actually kill MRSA on your skin and various other pathogens that are trying to get in. So your gut microbiome biome is doing a lot for you. So under normal healthy circumstances, your gut, your uh, intestines are lined with various immune cells that are working to keep all microbes inside the intestine and keeping them from getting into the bloodstream. Because even good bacteria, when they get into the bloodstream, can cause inflammation. Your immune system has to go get them. You can't have things that shouldn't be there in the bloodstream. So just like I already mentioned, the good microbes help to keep some of the bad pathogens out by basically just covering the intestine walls, keeping anything out. So just like the grass in a yard will keep the weeds out. If you don't have that grass and you have patches of dirt, those weeds are soon going to take over. And the same thing happens when you don't have enough good bacteria or good microbes in your gut, the bad ones are gonna try to take over because they're all around. It's very easy for them to kind of pass through anytime you eat something. Now, why does this happen? It can happen after a long prolonged course of antibiotics. It can happen if you're just not getting a balanced diet, you're not feeding the good bacteria bacteria that are inside various immune regulation. If you have an autoimmune disease or some other immune system dysregulation where that immune system within your gut is just not doing its job. If any bad bacteria set up shop, not only are you going to get GI symptoms such as diarrhea, maybe even blood in the stool, but also as those bacteria take over, they can even affect the lining of the GI tract. And it's possible that those bacteria and microbes that shouldn't be crossing into the bloodstream or into the surrounding tissue can start leaking out into the surrounding tissue. This is in common terms referred to as a leaky gut. And again, microbes should never really be going inside the body, right? The purpose is they go through the mouth, they pass through and they come out the other end. They really shouldn't be going inside tissues. They shouldn't be going in the blood. And when they do, the body goes on high alert to get them out. And so a lot of the inflammation that you get is really your body doing its job to kind of attack anything that shouldn't be there. So obviously when you have this big inflammatory reaction that causes a lot of different symptoms, but we're only gonna talk about how they relate to the skin because I'm a dermatologist. So which skin conditions um, are most associated with gut health? Many of the inflammatory conditions you think of, so these are psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, acne, rosacea, alopecia areata, and hydradenitis suppurativa. Atopic dermatitis specifically has been linked to gluten sensitivity or leaky gut. Rosacea is associated with a number of GI illnesses, including SIBO, which is a bacterial overgrowth, H. pylori, inflammatory bowel disease, in some cases, gluten sensitivity or celiac disease, and then alopecia areata is connected with ulcerative colitis. So if you suffer from one of these, and you want to see if your gut health could be contributing to your skin condition, what can you do? 
So the first thing that you can do is look at your diet. And the best thing that you can do is eat a diet that's high in fiber. So I know you've heard that before, but maybe you don't know the reason why. So fiber is a non-digestible carbohydrate. Basically think of like all the parts of the plant or the legume or the pasta that you can't eat. Or think about all the parts of like the broccoli that just aren't gonna be digested. They're gonna kind of go through you, right? That fiber passes through and it pretty much passes through the small intestine where some of all the minerals and everything that the body can get out has been taken out and then it ends up in the colon. Now, you might not have been able to use that fiber, but the bacteria go after it. The bacteria want to ferment that fiber. And when they ferment the fiber, they actually produce things that your body can use. And those are small chain fatty acids. And those become signaling molecules that can go out and cause anti-inflammatory effects, antimicrobial effects. Um, they can improve the integrity of your skin barrier. And so they're very useful molecules that your bacteria, your microbes are making for you. And all you have to do is feed the bacteria. So what foods have a lot of fiber? Vegetables, fruit, legumes like beans, whole grains, nuts, seeds, all the things that are supposed to be good for you, right? Now there are other non-digestible carbohydrates similar to fiber that also feed your bacteria. Polyphenols is one that you might have heard about. It's high in chocolate, in red wine, in the skin of red grapes grapes, as well as lots of other things that are good for you, like broccoli and blueberries, green tea, almonds, onions. These carbohydrates are not absorbed well by you, but they are a yummy snack for your microbes. Taken together, all of these non-digestible carbohydrates, fiber, the polyphenols and others are what is called prebiotics. Prebiotics, again, is pretty much the food for the bacteria. Now, what about foods that are probiotic? So probiotic means that it's actually a live culture, that they are bacteria. And there are many foods that are probiotic. In fact, majority of fermented food fits into this category. So that's yogurt, it's kimchi, it's uh, sauerkraut and kefir. Now, what foods are good to avoid? So research has shown that a diet high in industrial trans fatty acids, which is margarine, but is also present in the vast majority of snack food will increase harmful microbes and decrease the good ones. This is mostly going to be referred to as like hydrogenated oil. So when you're reading the package, it's going to be like hydrogenated blank blank oil. So that's, you know, it could be hydrogenated soybean oil, safflower, um, various vegetable oils that are hydrogenated. These are all pro-inflammatory. So basically it's nothing that you haven't heard before. Eat a diet that is tasting the rainbow, heavy in vegetables and plant fibers, a plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet, and eat very little processed hydrogenated fats. Again, nothing that you haven't heard before, but maybe knowing why that you're doing it, that you're actually giving your microbes all these healthy things so that it can protect. Let them do the work for you to help your skin, but also help some other things. Now, should you take a probiotic supplement? I think right now the jury is still out on that. Um, I think the research is still very young in this regard. Remember I said that you have trillions of microbes in your gut and everyone's slightly different. And so it's difficult to know which formula of a probiotic you should take. I think we'll know more and more as the research grows with this and that hopefully at some point we'll say, okay, you have rosacea, you need to take this formula of good bacteria or you have acne and you need to take exactly this. And there's some studies that are starting to come out and I think the vast majority show that generally lactobacillus and bifidobacterium species are primarily the good bacterium that are studied, but that doesn't mean that they've looked at everything and really narrowed it down. And so I think similar to like antibiotics, how like the first one just like penicillin and you just kind of throw penicillin at it and see if it works. As we know more, I think you're going to really be able to sort of hone down and target one specific problem with probiotic supplements. I think where probiotic supplements are the most effective is when you know that you're going to possibly be wiping out your microbes, your microbiome. So if you're gonna be taking antibiotics for extended periods of time, those are times where you may consider taking a probiotic, again, just to keep that grassy lawn filled and uh, keep anything bad from taking root. So speaking of antibiotics, are antibiotics good or bad for your gut health? They're a little of both. It is not very simple, like many things. So think of them like an herbicide. They are meant to target weeds and not kill the normal grass. 
And s similar with antibiotics, they're meant to kill the bad bacteria and not kill the good bacteria, but certainly they have the ability to wipe out some of the good bacteria, especially when you're taking antibiotics for prolonged periods of time, or you're taking like a very strong cocktail of antibiotics. Like if you're very sick and you're in the hospital. And there are also certain antibiotics that have this reputation of doing that more. For instance, clindamycin tends to wipe out normal bacteria and can allow a bacterium called C. difficile to really take root. And it has that reputation. Now, many different antibiotics can cause that problem, but certain ones can certainly cause that more often. Many of us who have taken antibiotics, even for short periods of time, know that it does affect your normal bacterium. And certainly things like candida, yeast can take hold and really get a foothold when the normal bacterium aren't protecting the ground. So yeast infections, for instance, are super common when you're taking antibiotics for that reason. Now on the flip side, if bad bacteria, pathogenic bacteria have taken over and are causing symptoms and are causing problems, sometimes antibiotics are the key to sort of wiping out those bad bacteria, clearing the ground and allowing for repopulation of normal commensal microbes. And so that's why antibiotics can be so useful in inflammatory skin conditions like rosacea and acne and hyperativa and hydridinitis superativa. So hopefully that's helpful. I do think this is an area that is expanding, that is growing. If I did the same video in a few years, it might be very different and much more robust than this video today. So I really look forward to seeing this field develop. So leave questions in the comments section. Certainly tell your story about how gut health has been related to your skin health. I'm Dr. Abby Waldman, be well.